Welcome everyone. The title of this talk is Polymorphic Record Types in a Lifted Embedding and I'm glad so many of you showed up despite uh, this rather unwieldy title. I briefly considered calling it Putting the Fun into Functional Dependencies. Maybe I could have filled the bigger room that way. So, um, by the way, please use the Scholarless app to rate this if you like it, also if you don't like it, but that's not mandatory. <laughs> so, uh, if you don't know me, my name is Stefan Zeiger. I am the tech lead for Slick, and I now work mostly on the Scala compiler team. So, I'm giving a talk which is in the intersection of Scala and Slick. So, we're really talking about a Scala feature, but uh, the topic of the talk is Slick, because we're using a part of Slick to explain this feature. How many of you have not used Slick? Can you raise your hands? Oh wow, that's actually a lot more than in New York. Most of them had used it, so I'll briefly recap. So Slick is a database framework for uh, accessing relational databases from Scala. So you, the idea is that you write your database query like a Scala collect, like using Scala Collections API. Like here we have this val q for a query is users, users table dot filter, some filter criteria dot map, and we map to the first name of the user. And uh, the code looks the same as if you wrote it on a Scala collection. And then you run this on the database. You just say db.run, give it your query, and you get a result back. And the whole thing is, of course, as we expect from a good Scala API, statically typed. So the result in this case is a future of vector of string because this uh, first up here, this is a string, and yeah, we're doing something collection valued, so you get a vector. Okay, so how is this implemented? That's the basic idea here to follow this plan. You write the query in Slick's lifted embedding Scala DSL. It used to be called lifted embedding. If you go to the new documentation, it's actually not called that anymore. We just call it the Scala API because it's the only one we have. But we used to have another direct embedding, and uh, this one is the lifted embedding. It's plain Scala code. There's, there's no macros in there, no pre-processing or any other tricks. Well, actually, there, there are macros, but we're not going to use them. And they can eliminate some additional boilerplates, but it's not important for what we're doing here. And uh, this lifted embedding then builds a slick AST that reifies the computation. So you can see exactly the original computation that you wrote in your Scala code in an AST that we compute from this uh, lifted embedding at runtime. And then the other boring part, we compile this uh, AST to SQL code with a large compiler of 20 stages or so, and we execute it on our database via JDBC, and it's all done in a mostly asynchronous way, so you get it back as a future or reactive stream. We don't care about all this uh, stuff at the bottom there today. So if you want to uh, find out more, go to slick.lightband.com. That's our new website on the new Lightband domain. So what we're going to use today uh, is dubbed Toy Slick. Uh, and you can also see the link here. This is directly to GitHub. And if you look at the history, I actually started with the current Slick master branch and removed everything we don't need here and simplified it further. So there's no query execution, there's no query compilation. There are simpler untyped ASTs with only a few features. There are no profiles for different databases, just a few operations, no option types in the lifted embedding. That's a big uh, complication usually. There are no type constructors, so we always use seek and give you a vector when you execute it. And there are no shape levels in case you've seen this feature in, uh, in Slick, like when it shows up in an error message or something. All we do is uh, write code in the simplified lifted embedding and then transform that to a simplified AST. So let's start with this AST, the abstract syntax tree. We have a base class or trait called node and then a few uh, child nodes that we need for our toy slick AST. So there's a, a literal node that contains any literal value, like a constant, and we have a product node that represents a tuple, like a, a tuple constructor, so you can tuple up multiple values. And we have a table node representing a table, and map and filter are operations. Ref refers to a variable, select, Select the field inside something, some other path, 
and apply, apply the function. I'm, I'm going through this very quickly because we can see it in an example here. This uses all of them except for uh, the product node. So uh, that's a set, the example from before. So here we have users. That's a table node. So we see table users down here. And uh, then we do a filter operation on top. So that's this one. And the filter has a from clause. That's, of course, users. And in the, in the where clause, we have this computation here, underscore.id less than 42. So that's the where clause. So underscore.id becomes select ID in ref S1, where S1 is the name we've given uh, to this uh, lambda, to the, to the variable in the lambda, and literal node 42, and the apply for the function call or for the operator. And the same for map. So on top of the filter, we have a map. And here we've written out the lambda. So the u in this case, that's the S2, gets a new symbol name. And then we have u.first. This becomes select first in ref S2. That's pretty much all we do for this uh, toy slick example. So uh, let's talk about the lifted embedding. First of all, why is it called the lifted embedding? Well, it's called an embedding because the query language is embedded in Scala. It's an internal DSL. And it's called lifted embedding, unlike, say, the direct embedding, because every type T is lifted into a type rep of T, a rep lifted representation. So uh, when you think uh, you have a value that's an int, like say, this thing here that you're comparing against 42, this looks like an int, but it's actually not. It's really a rep of int. So that's the lifted embedding. OK, so let's see how this rep looks. That's, that's the class we use for everything. Every expression in our lifted embedding is of type rep of something, at least initially. So uh, we have a trait, rep of t, as a super trait, and it needs two basic operations. One is called to node, obviously, because our only goal here is to build an AST. So we give it a to node method, which builds the AST for this specific rep value. And another one we need is encode ref. So every rep has an intrinsic AST that you get when you just call to node on it. But you can also encode a different AST into the rep. And uh, the contract is that you can call encode ref with some AST. We call it path here because it represents a path like a.b.c. And then when you call to node again, you get exactly that path out of it. And we use that in the map and filter functions that we'll, we'll uh, look into later. And in most cases, just having a simple rep of t is OK. Like for an int, you get just any rep of int. The exact subtype doesn't matter. And for this, we have a nice apply method in the companion object here that we can use to build such a simple AST. So we just give it the node, the intrinsic node to return. And when you call to node, you get that back. And when you call encode ref, you get a new, new simple rep of t, which will return whatever you encoded into it. So. Uh, when we look at this encode ref, what we really mean here is uh, to have a specific subtype of rep that we'd like to return. So if you go back to the old version, it just says rep of t. What we actually need in some cases is a type r, which is a subtype of rep of t comma r. But this would hugely complicate the encoding and maybe even make it impossible for the compiler to do the type inferencing correctly. So. Uh, we're playing a bit fast and loose with the types here, so you need some casts. I don't know if you've already seen some. No, we'll, seen some. we'll see some casts later that are needed because of this simplification. But we have a different way of ensuring that the types are actually correct, that you really do get the correct subtype that you want. OK, so uh, let's start with the simplest rep values, the primitive values. There's a class literal rep that can contain a primitive value lifted into a wrap. And it just contains the value. And you can use it for every type that has a, for which you have an evidence of type typed type of t. This is uh, 
rather fun, a funny name, especially in toy slick, because typed type is the only type we have in toy slick. The real slick has a class type that represents any type in the slick AST. We don't use that here. And typed type is a special type that has a scalar type parameter. So you can get an implicit typed type for a scalar type. And these are available for all the primitive types that you can use for a column. So Boolean, int, string, and a couple of others. Those are the, the types you can use for a column, possibly an option of this. But we don't have options here. And of course, the to note returns a literal note when you call it on this uh, literal wrap. And encode ref just gives you any wrap. We don't need a literal, literal wrap because for these simple types, having any wrap is enough. And you've seen this uh, underscore dot id less than 42, which looks like a regular less than method defined on int. It's actually not. That's what we have the extension methods for. So there's an implicit class, column extension methods, that works for any rep of t where t is a typed type. So for any primitive column, and you get methods like less than and equals. We have to use the triple equals because Scala already grabs the double equals and puts it into object, so there's no way we can enrich it uh, with an implicit conversion to give you a di different double equals. But for all other operators, like less than, we can just give you the correct uh, name that you expect. So what is, do these uh, operators return? Well, of course, they return a rep again. In this case, both return a rep of Boolean. Usually, the base operators would return a simple Boolean. So here it's a rep of Boolean. And what does it do? Well, it gives you an apply because it's a function application. We create a symbol that uh, represents the function. Symbols are just wrappers for, for strings in toy slick. The real slick has more complicated symbols again. And uh, this function application has two parameters. On the left-hand side, that's, oops, that's n dot to note, where n comes from here. And on the right-hand side, there's e dot to note. So we just reify this computation, left side and less than the right side. OK, those are the, the scalar primitive values, like Boolean, int, and string. We also need to represent tables. These are still scalar values, so they're not collections. But they, have, they consist of multiple fields. And for this, we have a superclass called table. A table of t is a rep of t. And uh, you give it a table name. That's the name it has in a database. And it has a method called column, which you use to construct a column. And of course, a column is a rep of whatever type you give it. And that type needs to have a typed type, as expected. What does it return when you call to note? Well, it returns a select and a select in the to node, which is the to node of the table itself. And it selects a symbol of the column name. So when you say u dot first, you get a select of symbol first in whatever this table currently represents. And you can see an example at the bottom. We have the table users, which extends table of tuple of int, string, and string. And it's called users. And then we have three columns, ID first and last. They got their type and their name. And uh, this rep here, the superclass, that's just a rep of tuple of int, comma, string, comma, string. Now, if you want to do computations in the lifted embedding on these user values, that's not really sufficient that you know it's a rep of tuple of int, string, and string. You want to be able to say u dot first and u dot last. So, re so you really want to keep the information that it is an instance of users. So unlike the primitive reps, we actually have to keep the knowledge of this concrete subtype around when we process this. We, we have to know that it's actually a user's instance and not just a rep of something. Otherwise, you could only refer to these fields as underscore one, underscore two, and underscore three. 
So how do we do this? That's where we use uh, this table tag that you've seen in the, in the table class. So the, the tricky bit is that EncodeRef needs to build an, a new instance of the correct type. So in this case, it needs to build a new instance of the same table class. And we do this with a tag which contains the constructor. So that's here. Users of tag, that's the constructor, and you pass that to the tag to encapsulate it. And the tag also can encapsulate any path you encode into it, any node. So the to node in table just asks its table tag for the node if it has any non-intrinsic node encoded into it, and otherwise you get a table node with the table name as the intrinsic node. And EncodeRef delegates to EncodeRef in the table tag. And here you can see this ugly cast because we don't have the exact types. So at least as far as the values are concerned, we now know that any primitive rep of t will give us another rep of t when we call EncodeRef, but if we call it on a table, we will get an instance of the correct table instance, uh, the correct table row class. So what about tuples? Tuples are sort of similar to tables because they can also contain different fields, different uh, individual columns. This is the naive encoding we used in Scala query. And uh, what we do here is because our basic assumption is that anything in the lifted embedding is of type rep, a, a tuple of T1 comma T2 is represented as a rep of tuple of T1 comma T2, right? So that's what we do. We have a special rep tuple class, rep tuple 2 in this case. It has two type parameters, T1 and T2, and it contains two values of rep and T1 and T2, and it is a rep of tuple of T1 and T2. It's not a real Scala tuple, though. It's, uh, it's our own implementation of something similar to a tuple. So we can define some methods like this tuppling operator that actually comes from Scala query. So when you have any primitive value, you can say A tilde B and you will get a rep tuple two of these two, right? So you tuple them up. And then if you do, do another tilde operator and another value, you're down here, you call this one, and then you can build a rep tuple three so you can append multiple columns to the tuple. And we did that for all arities up to 22, just auto-generate those, and that gives us something like this. So now we can build tuples. We have our users instance u, and we can build a sort of a tuple composed of u.id, u.first, and u.last. That's nice, but what we really want is this, right? We want to be able to use plain Scala code here. We want to be able to use real tuples. Just call a real tuple constructor. And we also want this. Not just put individual columns into a tuple. We want to be able to put arbitrary complex things into a tuple like the whole users row here. And if we can put a whole row inside a tuple, why not another tuple? So there's a tuple two that, as one of its elements, contains another tuple two. And some people have really huge tables with more than 22 columns. And of course, we need something for those as well if they really want to represent it in a flat way. So why not use age lists? They can be arbitrarily large. Now, all these things have, unfortunately, one thing in common that was our basic assumption so far. Those are not rep of t. They're all kinds of different types, tuple types and age list types, but not a rep of t. So how do we solve this? Well, we need polymorphic record types. That's the second incom incomprehensible part of the title. So what does it mean? If you go to Wikipedia, you'll find out that a record type has a fixed number of elements with a known type. And these elements also have names, but we can kind of count underscore one, underscore two, underscore three as names, right? So tuples qualify. And they're polymorphic, so that means they abstract over element types. 
In particular, if you have a tuple, you can put an int into it, and you can also, with a different type parameter, put a wrap of int into it. That's the part we care about. The same container type can contain an int and a wrap of int. So here are some examples of these polymorphic record types. Of course, tuples. As we've seen before, that's what we want most of all. You can have a tuple of int, <laughs> string, and string. And you can have a tuple of wrap of int, wrap of string, and wrap of string. And you can also mix it, like have an int and a wrap of string and a user's instance inside a tuple. That works. And we can have product-like types that are not tuples, but they're all isomorphic to tuples. So if we look at this class pair, that's pretty much the same as a tuple too, so we should be able to uh, use it in the same way. And we can also have ageless types because we already allow nested tuples. At least we want to allow them. So if we can manage nested tuples, we can manage ageless because ageless are basically nested tuples. They're isomorphic to nested tuples. So why not? Let's see if we get there. So here we need to take a little detour to functional dependencies. Because that's uh, an important feature of the Scala language that is required to implement this. So what we mean by functional dependencies are dependencies between type parameters. Here's an example, actually one that doesn't use functional dependencies yet, but we'll get to that in a moment. So we have this uh, class convert, which represents some conversion with a type from and a type to and a conversion function. And then we have implicit values like int to long, long to string, string to int. If you've seen Martin's keynote, you know that you never define an implicit function from int to string or something. But you can define a convert that wraps this function. And that can be implicit. That's a legal use of implicits. And then we can have a function f, which takes two type parameters, t1 and t2 takes a value of t1 and returns a t2. And how does it do that? It takes a convert, implicit convert from t1 and t2 and calls that. So it, it's not really surprising that the three lines at the bottom compile and run, right? The first one gets an int. So this is an int. We know that t1 is int. And it expects a long as a result. So that is t2. We now know t2, so we know we need a convert of t1, t2, where this is int and long. And we find that and plug it back in, and everything works. And the same for the other two. Now, the not so obvious part is this still works. We do not need to annotate these result types. And that's due to functional dependencies. So what happens here? Well, we again start with this value, 42, of type int. So now we know this t1 is int. This is known. And we do not know the result type. We just say val l equals f of 42. And the compiler is not either smart or stupid enough to assume that l stands for long. So this is undefined at this point. It's an undetermined uh, type parameter but we can still perform an implicit search. And even older Scala versions were able to do that. So you perform an implicit search of a, an instance of convert, where the first type parameter is int. And there's exactly one of them. It's this one, int to long. That's the only one where the first parameter is int. So we find it. That's not too hard. Now, the interesting part is, after resolving this implicit, the compiler now knows that the other type parameter, this t2, is long. So this one is now known, which means we know it here, and we know the return type. So the return type is actually inferred from this convert instance. So convert acts as a type level function here. One, we give it one of the type parameters, and it computes the other one through implicit search. And then we can use this other type parameter in the return value. This feature was actually added to Scala in uh, version 2.8 for the big collections redesign. 
Scala had a, a different kind of uh, collections library up to 2.7, and then Martin rewrote everything for 2.8 with this uh, neat can build from type class that you can frequently see in questions on Stack Overflow where people wonder what kind of error messages they get. And this also uses uh, functional dependencies, and they were added for this. So, for an example, you have an int, a collection like vector of int, but you want to call map on it. This map method is actually defined and implemented way up in the inheritance, inheritance hierarchy. So you have like vector uh, extends uh, immutable seek, extends uh, generic seek, extends uh, iterable, extends, no, extends seek, extends iterable, extends traversable, extends traversable like, and that's finally where we find the map method. And when you call map, you still get a vector back, even though it's implemented way up in the inheritance hierarchy. And that's using the same mechanism. So if we have a vector of int, then a in this case is int, and this wrapper b, that's the vector of int. So we call map, and it has two type parameters, b and that. We give it an f from a to b. So we know the wrapper already. We know the b from the mapping function. We do not know the that, which is the return type. So we use a can build from instance which is determined uniquely by the first two type parameters. And the third one, the return type, is computed from those through implicit search. That's exactly the same mechanism we saw before. And that's also the mechanism we're going to use for Slick. And uh, the class we have in Slick is called a shape. So uh, instead of requiring that every value that we deal with in the lifted embedding is a wrap of some type, we now require any type as long as we have a shape of that type available, which is a, a useful uh, thing to do in general. If you want to abstract further, move from inheritance to type classes. Do not require something to be an instance of whatever, just take an implicit value of some evidence type. So that's what we do. We have a shape and we can look it up exclusively by the mixed type, this first type parameter here, and from that we compute the unpacked type. So previously, the mixed type would always be a rep of t, and the unpacked type would always be the t. And then we also have the packed type, which is the opposite transformation. If you give it a t as the mixed type, you will get a rep of t of the packed type. So there's basically reps everywhere. We'll see in a bit why we need that. First of all, we only need the mixed and unpacked. So the simplest kind of shapes are those for primitive uh, values, for primitive types. So first look at the, at the type level stuff here, not at the implementations. So we have our example query again, users, filter, map, and so on. And uh, for every expression in there, we can get the right shape. So for this underscore dot ID, which is a rep of int, we get a column shaped shape, a column shape, which is available for every type T, which has, has a typed type, and gives you a, oops, a rep of T, a shape of rep of T, right. And for primitive values like 42, we have primitive shape, again also a T, which is a typed type, and you get a shape of T. And of course, both unpack to T. So the int unpacks to int, and the rep of int also unpacks to int if you run it. And both pack to rep of t. And then we have the table shape for our user's table row. And that's almost the same as a column shape. We need to do, use some tricky encoding there with this implicit evidence. What we really want to say is we have a c, which is a subtype of table of t. But we cannot just write it like that because Scala cannot infer it, so we use this, this little trick with the extra implicit. And then we get a shape of C, t, c. The same as the column shape in the sense that, uh, well, we'll get to that in a moment. Let's uh, look at tuple shapes first. So uh, what we do here is uh, we map from a user's row to u dot, a tuple of u dot first comma 42. So we put a, a rep of string and an int inside it. 
Now, when you call map, uh, there's an implicit shape required for the return type. So this, this will give you an implicit lookup of a shape of tuple of rep of string, comma int. And the other two, we don't care about. We don't need them. So for this, we have a tuple to shape, which gives us a shape of a tuple. So we need a tuple here. And this is the tuple shape. So we can get a shape of any tuple, provided that we have a shape for the left side and a shape for the right side. The left side here is a rep of string. So this u1 has to be a column shape. And the right side is an int. So the u2 is a primitive shape. And since we have functional dependencies, you know already that these other types that are computed, they flow up in the, in the uh, implicit resolution. So now we, all, we know all these types and can use them later on. And of course, we don't write these uh, tuple shapes by hand. They are still generated for all arities. So what about nested tuples? Well, there isn't really anything to do for nested tuples. Because in this encoding, they just work automatically out of the box. Let's see how. Here we have a tuple 2, which on the left side contains a string, a rep of string. u.first is a rep of string. So first we get a tuple 2 shape. And for u1, we need a column shape. And then for u2, u2 is of type tuple of rep of int, comma int. So that's another tuple 2 shape. So the left hand side of that is a rep of int. And the right hand side is an int. So we take that one here. And we got the shape. It's done recursively. And of course, the packed and unpacked types flow up recursively in the computation. So this just works like that. So uh, let's look at the shape implementations. We only looked at the types so far. And that's already enough to get the result type of a, a database computation inferred. But we want to be able to build an AST, so we need to do something with the values. Now, since a shape generalizes rep, and the two basic operations in rep were uh, two node and encode ref, we need the same thing in shape. So shape gets two node and encode ref. But a rep stands for a specific value, a shape only for a type. So these two take values as parameters in addition to uh, whatever else they take. And the second uh, pair of operations we have here is called pack and packed shape. So for a mixed value, we can return the packed value, and we can also return the matching shape for that. That's something we'll need to do later on. Now, this is the simplest shape implementation. That's the rep shape. And it's the simplest one because shape is a generalization of rep. So whenever we already have a rep, it should be trivial to return a shape for that. And this is true for both column shape and table shape. Both are just rep shapes with different implicits because we need to constrain the implicit shape here for a typed type and here we need a table, but they both return rep shapes. So a rep shape has a, the same mixed and packed types and both are reps. So to note just delegates to value dot to note and encode ref delegates to value dot encode ref. And since the type is already packed. The mixed and packed type are identical. Pack and packed shape are just identity operations. Nothing more to do. So what about primitive shapes? Well, we can define a shape for a primitive type T, which unpacks to itself, packs to rep of T. We can implement pack, which gives us a literal rep. We can create a packed shape, which is the rep shape again. We can get a to node operation. We just cheat. We call to node on whatever we pack to. But we have a problem with encode ref because the constraint was that the contract was that encode ref uh, plus to node has to give us the same path again. 
But here, this, this value v could be an int. How do you encode a path into the number 42? You cannot do that. So we just have to give up and throw an exception, which might become a problem later on. So we've looked at, uh, at scalar values. Now what about queries? A query uh, represents a sequence of values. So that's a collection. So a query of e of u is a rep of seek of u. But we also encode the mixed type in here. So e is the mixed type, whatever you wrote in your, in your uh, lifted embedding, and u is the unpacked type. We keep both of them here. So it, has a, it wraps a node, which is conveniently called two nodes, so we don't have to implement a separate method for that. And uh, it wraps a shaped value. I'm not showing the source code for that. It's just a, a combination of a shape plus its value with some convenience methods on it. So uh, we still need encode ref. Well, that just builds a new query. So for a query, what we need as a rep of whatever is actually a query. That's good enough. There are subtypes of query, but we never care about them. Query has the operations defined on it, so that's what we need. And to encode a path, we just give it a new path here in the constructor, and the shaped value stays the same. We don't have to do anything with that because it's really just a proxy. It's only relevant when we want to encode something into it. We need to be able to create an initial query for a table. That's called a table query. And yeah, we give it the constructor of the table and then it goes through the tag and so on. You can see the details here. You can also try it out. If you run the code, it doesn't really matter that much. More interesting is the operations that we implement. So uh, here's filter defined on a query. That's uh, a, the simplest higher order function that you can have. So it takes the regular filter on a collection takes a function from E to Boolean. So here it takes a function from E to rep of Boolean. We don't have to bother with abstracting through shapes because Boolean is a primitive type. So we always have a rep of Boolean. It's, it's that simple. And uh, what do we want to build? Well, we want to build the AST on the right, which contains a filter node. It has a symbol. We call that S9 here on the right. It's, this is the U down here. We cannot call it U because Scala doesn't tell us the name of the variable. We don't see that. We just generate a new name for it. And uh, we have our shaped value. We call encode ref and encode the ref to S9 into it. So whenever you call U in this expression like U.ID, this U now stands for ref to S9. So here we have u.id less than 42. So this u.id itself is now select id in ref s9. And the s9 is here. And we have a literal value, so that works, right? And map should work the same way. This is filter, this is map, they're, they're almost the same. There's one minor complication, map returns, has a different return type. So uh, now we need to take a shape. Map has a transformation from type E to F, and for F we need a shape, so we can also get the unpacked type, which we call T, and then we return a query of F comma T. The implementation is almost the same. We, get, we create a fresh symbol. It's called S8 here. We encode that into the shape value. We call our function on it. We package those up into a new shaped value and put that into the query. And what we actually uh, want as an AST is a map node that has the symbol. It has the original two nodes, so that's whatever we call it map on, and it has the mapping functions node. Okay, that looks reasonable. So let's try it. What happens in this example here? So we call map once and return a tuple, and then we call map again on the tuple. This is something you expect to work. But the problem is we put 42 in this. It's an int. The right-hand side of this tuple is an int, and this is a tuple which contains an int, and when you call map, it calls encode ref to encode this path to S8 or S9 or whatever it was into it, and this blows up. 
So this cannot work because we cannot encode anything into an int. So how do we fix that? Well, that's what we need the packed types for. We can encode something into a wrap of int. So we make sure that everything that comes out of a map call is actually packed. So now we get this uh, g here as the packed type, and we don't return a query of f comma t, we return a query of g comma t. So we pack it after every uh, transformation step that we need to do. And we do that by calling packed value on the shaped value, which just calls pack and packed shape and pairs them up again. And the rest is the same. This is the actual map implementation that we do. And now when we run that, this is a wrap of int because that's what came out of the first map call and everything works. So uh, we don't really have to go into the implementations of tuple shapes. Just a, a quick overview here. There's a, a superclass called product node shape which has some uh, auxiliary functions and we also generate some code but the, the main gist is in two node what you want to do for a tuple is uh, you take the individual element shapes, you zip them up with the elements, element values, and then for each of them, for each pair you call to node, and you put the whole thing into a product node. And similarly, in encode ref, you take the element shapes, you zip it with the elements, and you zip it with the index, and then you can call encode ref on each pair of element and its matching shape, but what you encode into it is not the original path that comes from up here, but it's a select in this path with a symbol underscore and the position. So when you have a, a tuple and encode a path into it, each element of the tuple actually is a select of the correct index in that path. So there's one final feature we haven't looked at yet, that's heterogeneous lists or H lists. So uh, if you haven't used those yet, they're almost like a regular Scala list. A list uh, is, a, is implemented as a cons list. So there are two cases. You have nil, which represents an empty list, and you have cons, which represents a concatenation of an element to the front of another list. So cons has a head value, which is an actual element in the list, and it has a tail value, which is the rest of the whole list. So you have like cons of A, comma, cons of B, comma, and so on. In the end, you have nil. And you do the same thing for H list, except that you keep the types of all these elements here. It has type parameters for the head and the tail, so you can write types like H cons of int, comma, H cons of string, comma, H nil dot type. That's like a tuple, which represents an int, a string, yeah, just an int and a string, that's it. Then comes h nil, so two elements here. And we can add some syntactic sugar and then you can write types like int colon colon string colon colon h nil. And the definition is recursive. So the tail here, t is an h list. So we can arbitrarily nest them through recursion. And this is the shape. That's really all you need to implement uh, support for H lists in ToySlick. So we can ignore the actual implementation up here. There's a, there's a super class that does most of the work. And the rest is uh, straightforward. What we really uh, care about is the types. So uh, to represent this, uh, we, need, we need to be able to get a shape for every kind of H list. So we follow the same recursion scheme as the H list itself. We first define a shape for H nil. That's called H nil shape. And it gives us an H list shape, which is, yeah, it's a subclass of shape. Where are we? Extends, yeah. So this, this extends shape of, of M in the end. So you get a shape of H nil dot type which packs and unpacks to h nil dot type. It's just an empty list. The types are always the same. And then you need an h const shape, which represents uh, the concatenation case. So h const shape gives you an h list shape for every type m1 colon colon m2, provided that you have a shape for the element type for m1, 
and an ageless shape for M2. We don't really need to say ageless shape here, but it uh, makes the lookup faster because there's nothing else it could be. And that's it already. So with these few lines of code, we can now use ageless wherever we want in Slick, wherever we could use uh, regular tuples or nested tuples or other structures. So we have a table of an ageless type and we use ageless here for our star projection and we use ageless here and of course when you run this thing the result you get is also an ageless so it works everywhere. I've compiled the lists, uh, the links for you again. So there's uh, the link to Slick and to Toy Slick, of course, and we'll publish the slides as usual. I think I'm out of time by one minute, but maybe we can still take some questions if you have some. Otherwise, uh, thank you for attending.